Hello everyone, this is Frank DeFreitas and welcome to Holotalk, the Internet's laser and holography talk show, enjoyed in over 42 countries throughout the world. And now, here's this week's show. Hello everyone, this is Frank DeFreitas and welcome to the 2004 opening show of Holotalk, now going into its eighth year of broadcasting on the Internet. My special guest for this show is Graham Saxby, who will be joining us via satellite connection from the Holotalk studio to his home in England. As you may or may not already be aware, Graham has just recently released the third edition of Practical Holography, which many people, myself included, consider the authoritative working manual for all things holographic. I was contacted by his publisher several weeks ago asking if I would review the book and decided to up the ante by suggesting that we do a live program with Graham to broadcast in association with the book's release. The book is already available in England and Amazon.com has February 2004 posted as its release date here in the U.S. For those listeners who would like to order a copy in the U.K., along with those listeners in the U.S. that would like to pre-order a copy, I've included links on the Holotalk page to Amazon.com in both the U.S. and U.K. I'd like to welcome all of the Holotalk listeners who have tuned into the program and look forward to bringing additional programming throughout the upcoming year. It's always a pleasure and an honor to be your host. And now, without further delay, here's Graham Saxby. Hello, everyone. This is Frank DeFreitas, and I have Graham Saxby on the line. How are you today, Graham? Oh, I'm fine, thank you. Yeah. Hello, uh, Frank. How are things on the other side of the pond? Well, a bit dull today and not very warm, but uh, it looks like being a reasonable sort of winter, I hope. That's nice. That's nice. We're getting ready to go into a very cold period here where we'll be down in single digits and below zero. Oh, yes. Within the next week, so. And and, to, and the past few days we were out with T-shirts on, so it's a, quite a difference. <laughs> yes. How are you overall? Well, we've, we've been without T-shirts for some time now, but it hasn't been really cold. We, we get a bit of frost, but uh, in this part of the world it's generally fairly warm because we're, we're fairly near some big cities. Yes, yes. Well, we have we have a very good connection. Yes. So we're thankful for that. And I, I thought we would start off the interview by uh, jumping right into a few questions that I'm sure a lot of the listeners have out there. And that is when the first edition of Practical Holography came out in 1988. Um, it was well received and almost instantaneously went into what we would say could be the Bible of practical practice of holography. With the new edition, what's new? Oh, well, um, the, with the first edition, really, I was just sort of putting together everything that I knew about holography at the time. And uh, as time went on, it became more and more obvious that there were bits missing and things had moved on a bit. And uh, I went into a second edition, and now, of course, things have moved on again. And the most important thing, of course, being that um, lasers have suddenly come down in price. We've got diode lasers, which are really very good. Mm-hmm. And people can now pretty well literally make holograms on the kitchen table. Yes. So, of course, that was the first thing that had to be amended. And I had to put in that sort of thing. And some of us in the Royal Photographic Society's holography group have been doing quite a lot of work on doing little workshops showing people how they can make holograms with very simple lasers, the sort of thing you can buy in souvenir shops. Yeah. I actually bought one in Greece for under two pounds sterling, and you couldn't even buy the batteries in this country <laughs> for that sort of money. And um, really, we've been able to get quite good holograms I've done a lot of work with with Jeff Blythe, mm-hmm. who is a bit of an expert in the processing system, and he's evolved some very good processing. And the other thing, of course, is that I've had to bring some of the um, applied holography up to date. Yes. I'm, I've been keeping up with that because I'm, I have a, a company that uh, 
supplies me with abstracts, and I've got abstracts of every paper that's been written on holography or even mentioning holography for the last 25 years. Mm -hmm. So it, it's fairly easy to keep up with that. But it, it's rather surprising, going through the previous edition, um, how little has really been done. Yes. Um, as, far as, uh, as far as display holography is concerned, really, I think we reached the peak several years ago. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And not very much more has happened. People have just got better at it. Yes. But, of course, there have been big advances in data processing and that sort of thing, and um, particularly in embossed holography and security and so forth. Yes, that's not well, a big I had field. to completely rewrite the chapter on security holography. I guess, I guess the answer with electronic holography and the transmission of this information is going to come through uh, compression. Oh, yes. Yes, very much so. And there's, there's a lot of work, really, um, to be done with... Um, well, you can call it electro-holography or, or something of that sort, but really it's um, using, um, using um, electronic imaging mm -hmm. to produce the objects for the holography rather than anything else. The other thing is, of course, that with electronic imaging, we still haven't really got down to the sort of resolution that you need to make the traditional sort of holograms with off-axis beams. Yeah. At the moment, they can still really only make satisfactory holograms either with on-axis beams like Garbo holograms mm -hmm. or the slightly off-axis ones that you have with Fourier transform holograms. Uh, Fourier transform holograms are the, the main sort of thing in data processing. Like, I remember back in the late 70s, perhaps early 80s, and I think the company was named Aerodyne, but they had a holographic printer that would write out a uh, computer-generated hologram pixel by pixel. Yes. And I believe it took like 12 hours for a one-centimeter square area to be written. Yes, it would. Um, that was one of the troubles that um, Steve Benton's team had when they were trying to produce holographic video. Mm -hmm. they, they found that it would take 25 minutes to print out a, a, a single... Um, television um, picture yeah. and yeah. Uh, of course that really that was um, how Benton's rainbow holograms came about because he was trying to reduce the amount of information yes. by cutting out the vertical parallax mm -hmm. and he finished up with a rainbow hologram rather I think to his surprise than everybody else's yeah. and of course that was the start of the whole business of commercial embossed holograms yeah, that's an amazing story with the, the uh, development of the uh, rainbow hologram, basically due to the fact that uh, they were trying to decrease the amount of information that would have to be transmitted and written. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So we were all devastated when Steve uh, died, of course. Yes. Very, very sad indeed. Yeah. One, one of the great pioneers, and uh, such a wonderful fellow, too. And I was proud to call him a friend of mine. Yeah, we actually have an interview on the uh, Holotalk archive page with Steve, so if any of the listeners who are new to the show have not had an opportunity to uh, hear Steve Benton, there's a, there's a show on the page there oh, yeah. as well. And uh, I want to thank you very much for uh, coming on the show, by the way. Oh, no, and, no. Uh, and also uh, for having the publisher send that copy of the book. Mm. And uh, as usual, it's an excellent book. And uh, so, so you're saying basically uh, what you feel are, are the the largest areas uh, of of inclusion or, or new areas of inclusion in the book would be uh, the uh, diode holography and also several new formulas that you have in the book as well. Oh yes, very much so. And I, I have to be very grateful to Jeff Blythe for that as well because he spent a lot of time not only working out how to make red sensitive dichromate mm -hmm. but um, how to make your own holographic emulsion from mm -hmm. scratch yes he's working in Cambridge University at the moment um, not on holography as such but um, using holographic emulsions mm -hmm. in diagnostic things what, what he did very roughly is to make a trivial hologram that is a, just a hologram of a mirror and then he um, subjects it to various sorts of things, you know, bacteria and so forth, and from the color changes it's possible to diagnose what's going on. 
Mm -hmm. So it's quite an exciting thing, but it's not direct holography as such. Yeah, On the yeah. other hand, he has to have reliable emulsions, and so he had to work out how to make them himself. Mm -hmm. And that, of course, is something that I've been able to publish in this new edition. Well, that's wonderful that that's in the book and it's out there now. The other thing about it, of course, is that I, I have rewritten the format completely. Mm -hmm. and the old one, it was a bit textbookish, and um, I've really taken a leaf out of the Open University's book. And um, what they do, because they're a distance learning thing, their textbooks have to be pretty close to having a tutor breathing down your neck. Mm -hmm. And therefore, they're, they're all sort of first person and, uh, you know, this is what I'm telling you kind of thing. Yes. And uh, they, to keep the continuity, all the anecdotes and various little side bits are actually put in margins. Mm -hmm. and the smaller diagrams go into margins as well and that gives a much better continuity yes and I, I tried this in the first place in the last book which I did which wasn't altogether about holography it was called the science of imaging and uh, that was, well, it was about photography and television and video and holography and everything else <clears throat> and it worked so well that I, I thought I'd like to try the same format for mm -hmm. practical holography when we came to rewrite it yeah, it, it appears it's been through a number of different publishers. It started off with Prentice Hall, mm -hmm. and Prentice Hall, um, of course, like all these other firms, a tremendous lot of selling out to different companies goes on, and they finished up with Pearson Education, mm -hmm. who found they hadn't really got room for a book of that type on their books. And by very good fortune, I got it in with the Institute of Physics Publishing. Mm -hmm and I was doing some freelance editing for them and they thought it would be a very good idea to take this book under their wing as it were and they, they really have been absolutely first class they've been tremendously helpful it does seem to appear that it's evolved into somewhat more of a uh, beside the table workbook where everything is broken down into step by step modules exactly yes. Yeah. yes that was just what I wanted to do in the first place See, when, when I was actually working, um, partly uh, at the Royal College of Art and partly at Wolverhampton University, and I had these students, and of course I had to teach them, as it were, breathing down their shoulders, and I thought the best thing I could do was to put that into words as best I could. Mm -hmm. Because uh, I'm, I, mean, I was getting older, and I was already beyond my retiring age, and they'd stopped paying me a salary, people sort of breathing down my neck and saying, you know, we, we need this place, we need more office space, what are you doing working in here? You should have been retired long ago. <laughs> I, I think it happens to a lot of people in academic life. Do you, and of course, uh, as soon as they got rid of me, they turned the whole place into offices, and that was that. I, I was very lucky to be able to pick up the equipment round the back door for a fairly small sum, but um, unfortunately I wasn't able to build myself my own lab, which I would have liked to do, so yeah. I, I sold off the, the bits to various friends of mine in the profession. Oh. You're, you're, going around and, uh, you're going around and lecturing now? Yes, yes. Um, not an awful lot. I'm, I like to feel I have been able to retire a bit and look after the garden. And mm -hmm. I, I, I still do writing and editing, of course. How often do you make it to the States? Do you come over? Um, well, I, I used to come over regularly to mm -hmm. uh, Tung Jiang's symposia at Lake yeah. Forest, mm -hmm. but I haven't been able to get hold of, get over recently, really, for family reasons. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I just have to wish them well. I mean, well I, I'd like to get over to the States again, but I just haven't been able to. What, what's the uh, holography community like in uh, England right now? Um, well, the the uh, artistic side is it's a bit weak in numbers but it's pretty strong in creativity we've mm -hmm. still got Margaret Benyon of course yes and who just received uh, what is the award that she received from the Queen oh mm -hmm. she got the uh, MBE that's um, okay. it's short from member of the British Empire yes. <laughs> it's a rather out of date sort of name mm -hmm. but it's um, it's one of the senior honours 
not quite as good as a knighthood. Yeah. But, uh, so, so she's not Sir Margaret Benyon. No. No. <laughs> no, she's she's two notches below that. Okay. But um, it's certainly a re the f really, I think, the first royal recognition of holography. Mm -hmm. Although she knows Prince Charles. He yes. actually visited her when she was working in Australia wow. and asked her about holographic portraiture. Well, in those days, there weren't any pulse lasers, mm -hmm. so that wasn't possible. But we still live in hopes. Mm -hmm. uh, is the program at RHC still intact? No, it no. isn't. I, I get emails all the time asking me about um, Yes, programs. it would have been lovely. It really was good. I mean, I, I had quite a hand in, in starting the thing up because Michael Langford, who was head of photography at, at that time, another chap who very sadly died an awful lot too early, he, mm -hmm. um, he and I put the idea together and we designed the, the rooms and Nick Phillips um, organized all the equipment and we put this thing together and altogether we, um, we taught a, a, about 30, 35 students and they all became professional holographers. Mm -hmm. But the real trouble was that the Royal College of Art will only take graduates. Mm -hmm. See, they only award master's degrees and doctor's degrees. And, and the, it, it was drying up because all the various universities were gradually giving up um, holographic labs. Yeah. Mine was the last, in fact. Um, Liverpool Polytechnic was... Uh, um, Rod Murray was the next before last, and when Rod left that, he actually took over the RCA. And um, then eventually when mine packed up, there were no more graduates. And so <laughs> there were no more students. Yeah. And that was that. And what, once again, the administrators marched in and said, oh, we need more office space. And mm -hmm. in any case, the equipment was beginning to get a bit old and sort of studentized. Those students that went on to uh, obtain their graduate degree at uh, Royal College of Art uh, in holography, um, are they finding employment? Well, most of them are still working freelance. A, a lot of them have got sort of daytime jobs. Yes. But uh, there's still quite a few who are exhibiting regularly. And um, some of the others, the original technician, uh, Rob Monday, has, has got his own... Um, his own company down in Surrey okay. and they're doing very well making large holograms and doing masters for uh, embossing and that sort of thing that's probably similar to John Perry's company here Holographics North up in Burlington, Vermont I would that's imagine. right, yes. Yeah. yes, very much like yeah. that and a number of others have gone on to work for various companies and do their own thing in holography on the side well, you, you started in photography, right? I imagine, were you um, doing imaging for the Air Force or something, Royal Air Force? Yes, that's right. Um, in <clears throat> just after the war, I was actually working um, in, working in aircraft industry on wind tunnels, and I absolutely hated the job. And I wanted to be a photographer. I was already doing quite a lot of freelance work. And at that time, we still had national service. So when you were... 18, you, you got called up, that is, you, you got drafted, and you did two years in the Army. Mm -hmm. And I was working in the air, aircraft industry, so I was excused that. But if I left the aircraft industry, of course, I would immediately be conscripted into the Army and spend two years washing out the trains or whatever it is that mm -hmm. national servicemen do. The only way I could get out of that was to join the RAF as a photographer. And, of course, I'm... When I did that, I got all all the proper training, all the technical training, and yeah. became, well, I hope is qu quite a good technical photographer. Was that aerial photography? Um, aerial photography comes into it a lot, yeah. but uh, I was lucky enough to get quite a, a lot of jobs doing ground photography, okay. where I, I did everything. I, I spent a lot of time doing public relations in Germany. I'm, I met a lot of... Uh, very exciting people. I photographed almost all the royal family and the uh, German people, Conrad Adenauer and company. And, and there was one occasion when uh, I had I photographed General Galland. He was he was the Red Baron of the Second World War, and he was 
presented back with his iron cross by the chap who'd shot him down during the Battle of Britain. It was all very exciting. He was the most delightful man. And had all sorts of exciting assignments. And also, unfortunately, we had a few post-mortems and, and crashed aircraft and things like that. So, you know, you, you just had everything. Yeah. And but the aerial reconnaissance photography, of course, was the big thing in those days. Mm -hmm. um, now there isn't very much of it. What there is is mostly sort of low-level stuff. Well, having, having a look inside woods at very low level, but the high level stuff is all done by satellites. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, your interest in this uh, gravitated more towards the technical. Yes, but I, I did an immense amount of portraiture and weddings and things like that. Oh yeah. So, I mean, my my general interest is actually in in landscapes and architecture. Mm -hmm. and I oh, okay. A, a huge file of them, about twenty thousand photographs. <laughs> Looking at them now, it's stacked on the shelf about three meters high, three meters wide, and they're all negatives and transparencies. Yeah, that that seems to be the final frontier with holography is just to be able to get affordable emulsions, yes. and that's where Jeff's work uh, comes in. Yes, and it is a difficulty. I mean, it was an awful blow when Agfa packed up mm -hmm. making their emulsions. Yeah, I loved Agfa plates. In, in a way, of course, it was a good thing because the Agfa emulsions weren't really very good. Mm -hmm. They were nice they, to work with. They, they they were very forgiving. Oh, yes. Yes, they had a tremendous latitude. I remember I was trying to demonstrate the effects of overexposure and underexposure, and I actually had to underexpose by a factor of 10 before it became visible. Yes. And overexpose by a factor of nearly 50. Yeah. Before you could see any deterioration in the image. Yeah, it was it was real nice to keep exposure time short because you could always make it up in the development. Yes. Yeah. Yes, that that was another thing that um, Jeff and I evolved. Um, Jeff got the idea of of using um, a developer containing pyrogallol. Mm -hmm. Pyrogallol is a developer that was used um, by the very old photographers. It was one of the first yeah. developing agents. Still my favorite pyrochrome yeah. process. Yes. Well, that I mean, we we sort of developed that process, and um, and I got onto it from process that we used to use in the RAF. And when people came back from reconnaissance sorties with stuff that had been grossly underexposed, and we used to use a developer that contained paragallol and metol, mm -hmm. and this would give an increase in exposure of anything up to three stops. Yeah. The quality was pretty awful, but at, at least you had an image. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I worked on this and eventually came up with the formula that's in my book with pyro and metol, and that gave tremendous contrast, and it held back some of the, um, some of the noise that was typical of Agfa mm -hmm. um, because of the yellow stain that it produced. The only trouble was it stained everything else, including your fingers and yeah. your clothes. Well, you know, photography uh, chemistry has a long history of uh, toxicity oh, just yes. across the board, but we've certainly come a long way away from the days of uh, parabenzoquinone, the PBQ, and the mercuric chloride bleaches. Oh, the horrible stuff. Yeah, I, I worked with both of those in the early days. Yes, so did I. Yeah. Um, the book is available now in the UK. I imagine someone can order that right now. Yes. And yes, it costs fifty-five pounds sterling. You can get it through Amazon, of course. Yes. If anybody is really stuck, then um, if they get in touch with me, I can sort something out for them. Okay. Um, and Amazon.com here in the US will actually have it available. I think they're going to ship it in February 2004, so they're accepting pre-orders for the book now, I believe. I believe one, so, yes. Yeah. I, I haven't had a look at their website. Yeah, one, one, 115 U.S. dollars, which just for the yeah. processing formulas and the um, emulsion formulas itself could pay for itself. Well, it's only the cost of a couple of large plates, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Oh, my goodness, I'll tell you. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. But, Yes, well, in, in this country, as I said, it's, it's 55 pounds sterling. Um, so, in, in fact, 
if you ordered it from this country and had it shipped out by um, by uh, surface, it'd probably be cheaper than buying it in the USA. Mm -hmm. Had you considered doing a multimedia CD-ROM at any point? No. No, to like be a supplement to the book. Well, um, I, I I sort of gave it some thoughts mm -hmm. and, and then thought no. It's um. Due to the production involved? The, well, the no, I'm, I'm not really terribly well up in, in that particular bit of technology. Mm -hmm. in, in fact, I only bought a computer when some of the stuff I was writing, the, the uh, publishers demanded it on, on floppy disks. Yes. And so I, I had to get a computer in order to produce it in the format they wanted. And I'm, I've been a sort of reluctant learner. I, I work on what the services used to call a need-to-know basis. Mm -hmm. <laughs> As soon as I need to know something, I, I look it up and work out how to do it. Do you get a chance to go out onto the Internet to uh, see what's out there for holography? Oh, yes. Yeah, there's a wonderful forum, Network 54, which um, has has cropped up, which is a, a very active community of uh, holographers as well. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I've come across that. Yeah. And, uh, of course, your interview will be up, and uh, I'm going to head out on the road after I finish this up and uh, I'll make sure that before I leave today that the interview is up and that the notice goes out to all of the uh, Holo Talk listeners and I hope you tune in to listen to it as well. Well, I certainly shall, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Is there anything... <laughs> probably make me curl up just listening to it. No, oh, no, no, no. Is, is there anything that uh, we didn't cover that you'd like to say to the listeners while we uh, are on the tail end of the interview here? I can't think of anything specific and... I appreciate all that you've done for holography. Oh, uh, well, yes. I, I mean, what I, the only thing that I really did do, apart from stealing everybody else's ideas, is, is to, um, you, to, you, 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 to get you, holography, on, uh, as I said, onto the kitchen table. Mm -hmm. You see, there, there was one particular aspect of holography that always bothered me, and that, that was the beam splitter. Mm -hmm. And I felt that the beam splitter was a single object on the table that made holography difficult and made made bad holograms mm -hmm. because as soon as you started turning one beam of light one way and the other beam of light the other way yeah. you were turning them through different bits of air yeah and we certainly found that the the major problem in big table holography was air currents yeah and defining big table by the size would be well, anything above one by two meters. Yeah, so you're talking about your typical in U.S. measurements, your typical four by eight uh, vibration ta isolation table. That's right. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, the, the main table as I used at Wolverhampton well, was um, one and a half by two and a half meters. That's mm -hmm. um, about uh, seven feet by twelve feet, something yeah. like that. And uh, that's a nice size. Yes. Yeah. Yes, it was lovely. I, I built a gantry on top of it, and it made the whole thing very rigid indeed. Yeah, that that, is that, the, is, that, that one of the, is that one of the pictures that's in the book? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Um, the, the main thing that, I've, that I worked on um, was what I, I had to coin a name for it. I called it a bypass hologram, and you didn't have to have a beam splitter at all because you just used the two halves of a spread beam, and you reflected one... Um, using a mirror mm -hmm. into the other one, so that um, you uh, you actually had a mirror alongside your object. Yes. And the mirror provided the reference beam, and the reflection from the object provided the object beam. Yeah. You couldn't really get any simpler than that. Yeah. And the two beams were so close together that they were going through very much the same airspace. Yeah, I, I, I believe there's an example of that also at someone's website, maybe I think in Norway or something like that. They're using a technique very similar to that. Very yeah. likely, but it certainly worked. It worked. It worked like a dream, and mm -hmm. I, I never had a bad hologram using that system. I, I don't claim originality for the first thought. It, it was Hans B. Elkhagen who thought of it. Yeah. Um, it, he had to make some holograms of things like milling machines on a factory floor. Mm -hmm. And so he had to build a little dark room around them, and he used that method. He actually taped a mirror to the machine itself. Yeah. 
I know you used the term that you you had stolen other people's ideas, but I don't. I think that a better term for that would be that you've just taken other people's ideas, and you've provided the service of actually compiling those ideas into one reference. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's, that's a nice way of putting it. Yeah, that's that's essentially what it what it is. I mean, yeah. we we both. Well, I, I was fortunate enough to be able to discover and um, how to make all the main types of holograms using this same basic setup mm -hmm. and that really was quite exciting and I wrote a paper for, for Tung Jong's symposium mm -hmm. about it and it went down very well in fact yeah. and with the, with the higher diffraction efficiencies of the newer emulsions it's a wonderful thing too oh yes it is yeah yes it well, really is well Graham I want to thank you very much for taking the time to uh, come on the show and uh, speak about the book, and I want to remind the listeners one more time that there are, there are links to both Amazon.com UK and Amazon.com here in the U.S., where if you happen to be in England listening to this, you can order the book and have it delivered now, and the release date in the United States is February 2004, but you can pre-order that book and have that shipped to you as soon as it's available from Amazon. Graham, thank you so much. If you just want to hold on the line for a second, uh, I'll get...